I don't know if you hit that deer with your car, didn't you? <laughs> All right, employer certification. What do you need to have for your employer to certify you? Come on, you should know this already. Receive. Receive what? Certification. Well, first you got to go get classroom training. How much? 16 hours NAS or 8 hours SNTTC 1A, right? Yeah, look at that. That was quick. All right. Uh, written tests. Administered. <coughs> By who's going to give the written test? Employer. Employer. So we may have a general and specific. So general will be general non-destructive testing procedures. Specific would be specific to that method. Often the general procedures have a lot to do with how things are made. And the specific would be how to test it using the, the appropriate medium. Um, a practical exam. What's the practical exam? Demonstrating your knowledge. Running the machinery. Can you do it? And you have to have an eye exam. Who's going to administer that? Doctor. Doctor. The employer. <laughs> You check your eyes. So you're gonna check check near vision, and you're gonna use a Jager chart. J E G Jager chart. Yep. A Mick Jagger chart. And color. With the Ishihara. Shihara test. But what if they wear glasses? Like, does that matter? Yeah, wear glasses. Doesn't matter. Oh, okay. You 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 just have to whatever it is you you have when you take the test. So <clears throat> I would just probably get stronger glasses <laughs> uh, because I took this picture and I want you to notice this is uh, probably. 12 font right here and so that is very very tiny and so you have to I think you have to read J1 yeah, I saw the people waiting in the mud while purchasing their provisions and so yeah it's this kind of weird thing they have you read uh, the above letters sub 10 the visual angle uh, I don't remember it says in the card it's like close. It's like 12 inches or something. So, all right, so there's your, your Mick Jagger test. There's your Ishihara. There's Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. This one? You should see an eight. Everybody sees an eight? You guys can't play along very well, can you? You would have had him going for a while, but no, he had to. It's a five and a three. Yeah, but that's not because you can't see. This is, you don't know your numbers well. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. Uh, what is yeah. that? Oh, that's for later. <laughs> so yeah, that's normal writing. You can see normal writing over here is going to be about about this, about here maybe. That gets very very tiny. I can't even see that. And you got it blown up on the board. You should really be able to see it. <laughs> I don't see the colors. You didn't? Are you serious? No, it's serious. Well, that's why you have that test. All right. Uh, I'm going to throw this in here just for a great example of what, what you can expect, expect to see. So, 
Who's Lycoming? And they don't pronounce it that way, do they? Like coming. Like coming. All right. So if you are going to, you're going to overhaul engines, you're going to be the engine business, and you want to do non destructive testing on engines. And I'm looking at uh, Lycoming SI 1285 Foxtrot. What is SI? Service instruction. Service instruction 1285 Foxtrot. Foxtrot's the latest version of it. I don't know what the latest, but this is what I looked up. It says this, you must be, this is in quote, qualified and certified. <clears throat> qualified and certified. Well, don't you have to be qualified to be Nope. We talked about that. I'm, I'm qualified. I have... I have in the past recent, uh, within the last, what is it, three, four years, I have, I have over 32 hours of classroom training and I have way over 270 hours of experience in PT. So am I qualified? Yeah. Uh, my employer certified me? No. They have not. So I am highly qualified in these two right here and current with my classroom training, but I don't have a certifying employer. Okay, so could the school qualify me? They absolutely could. So what would they have to do? They would have to read your notes to you. They would have to go through the steps to qualify through ASNTT1A and NAS410, set up a non-destructive program, get a level three involved, and set it all up, and then they could certify me as a level two. Yeah, they're not going to do that. Sounds expensive. And time consuming, and what would be the uh, benefit to the school? There's no money involved. They can start a side hustle. You can't, no. <laughs> I, I can do classes? Um, I'm looking into, I think I can still do it. So, but it's just easier to hire somebody. So you, you teach. So anyway, yeah. When they define classroom as 16 hours? Yeah. Like when you go to A&E or A-S-E, A-S-E, are you going to do like there? They have a level three that instructs you to get those I don't think they have classes. You have to go to a different school. Okay. Like when I went to yeah, Healy, your school in LA. Yeah, that level three is teaching. So does our classroom time not count because it's not a level three teaching? I'm going to get back to you on that one. <laughs> Just go with the flow, Steven. Just go with the flow, Steven. <laughs> it's like <laughs> All right, so there we go. Ishihara <laughs> test. <laughs> now what? This one. Okay. Uh, so light combing. So th I, I want you to get a feel for what, what the industry is expecting from you. You can't just go out there and start doing these tests. I know I'm going to say it. I know people are going to go out there and do them anyway. Like, well, I remember. I had some red stuff. and So, okay. You, you must be qualified and certified. Actually, that's not the end of the quote here. Qualified and certified to a written procedure, to a written procedure, IAW. What does that stand for? In accordance, in accordance with NAS 410. So if you're not qualified and certified to NAS 410, you can't do this. doesn't matter what what kind of equipment you have, doesn't matter how great you are. Uh, so could a shop call me up today and say, hey, we've got, we've got an engine we need NDT'd. I know you got brand new equipment. It's absolutely qualified, certified. By the way, all of our new equipment came with certification, so that equipment is, is solid. Every light, every <coughs> test, piece of test equipment, it's got a certification uh, card with it that's good for at least a year. So can I do it for them? Yes. Why can't I? You, you are certified. I am not no. certified. Am I qualified? Yes. 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 Did I used to be certified? Yes. 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 But am I now? No. no, I'm now I'm just qualified because I don't work for the employer anymore. Okay. All right. Qualified, certified, written procedure. Can you be a level one, two, three? Does it matter? Did they? Does it? It just says qualified, certified. Could be anybody so far. 
persons who make accept or reject decisions must be a level two. Well, now it does. <laughs> So can I assign my level one to do a crankshaft, go have a, my cup of coffee, tea, and come back in a little bit and ask them how it went? You know. Yeah, well, it's got to be my name on it. I'm the one that has to make the accept or reject, and I'm not going to accept or reject something I didn't visually inspect 100% of. Uh, procedures. I think I can fit this in here. Procedures. must be approved by a level, level what? Three. Three. In accordance with, what do you think? NAS 410. NAS 410. So can my level three just make up some stuff? Yep. <laughs> Like, well, let's, let's make it work with what you got. Kevin? Yeah? No. Um, you talked a lot about, like, the qualification stuff, but how does it actually fall into, like, a regular day of work? How does it what? Fall into, like, a regular day of work. Like, is it just something that you do? Are you stationed there? Like, is that what you do all the time? Oh, it depends on, um, I got to go back because Janet's having a meltdown over here. I was just flipping. Here. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, so um, there are some places where that's just your job. You, you do magnetic <coughs> particle, and maybe you're cross-trained to do um, liquid penetrant, or maybe you want to do another. <coughs> there are some companies, um, like one of the ones that we work with, QCNDT. Uh, he is like a level three in almost everything, you know, and so you can call, his name's Dave Arms, he's a great guy. Call him up, Dave, I got an airplane that needs uh, this part uh, ultrasound inspector, this part eddy current, and he's a mobile guy, and he'll show up, and he'll do the test, and bill you, and then off on his merry way. Uh, for me, it was just part of the job that I did is building engines, so I would, I managed my own, my own day, so I would set things up, and so I would have a series of engines in various stages, and then one day I would say, okay, today I'm going to do NDT on engines, so that would be my NDT day, and so I would do maybe two, three, four, or five engines that day. So him being like a mobile guy for himself, yeah. how is he certified? Central cert. Okay. Or he can self-cert through his business if he follows NAS 410 and sets up a company. Okay. I could do that. I could set up my, my company, as far as I know, and then apply through and follow the, uh, the procedures and set up my company and then self-certify. But... I don't think there's a way where you can just do it without an outside. You got to have a level three somewhere that was central certified. Okay. Can I move this now, Janet? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. Okay. So what we last left off, the last thing I said there was the. Um, what did I say, Janet? Tell me what did I say? Uh, Procedures, Procedures must be approved by level three in accordance with NAS 410. Okay. So 410 and. As if that wasn't enough, procedures and steps must comply <coughs> with ASTM E1444 for MT. What's MT? It means there's nothing in it. Um, magnetic particle. And ASTM E1417 for PT. So that's what Lycoming says. So not only do you have to follow the NAS 410 certifying procedures, but then you have to follow ASTM 1444 and 1417 for the actual procedure of what you're doing. So it gets very detailed. And by the way, some of these ASTMs, they can cost you up to 150 bucks just to get a copy of this. They are not cheap at all. So some of this stuff gets very expensive. Uh, that was Lycoming. Uh, TCM, what is TCM? It is not really called TCM anymore, but that's just what I'm going to keep calling it. So, um, 
Who do I have here? So this would be for uh, PT. They want in accordance with ASTM uh, E1417, E1208. This is just what's in the service bulletin, E1209, E1219, and type one. Type one, what is type one? Penetrant. That's fluorescent, not the visible. Method A, B, C, or D, which will mean something to you later. Um, personnel, certified to level two and three. It says personnel certified to level two using procedures approved by level three, I should say. So level two uh, approved by level three. There we go. And when I was doing engines, I, I haven't read the service bulletins in a little while. Continental had a wonderful service bulletin that said all six cylinder engines and, and define all. Right. That means if it has six cylinders, it is one of them. All six cylinder engine, all six cylinder crankcases when removed from the crank, all six cylinder crankshafts when removed from the crankcase <coughs> must be ultrasound inspected. And the ultrasound inspection had to be complied with by somebody who was specifically trained at the Continental Factory or one of their authorized schools to tr ultrasound their crankshafts. And this was a very expensive school that you had to go to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's talk about definitions now. All right. Um, when you get into the world of NDT, there are de definite meanings to certain things. And you got to know what these are, especially if you start taking some of the tests. So an indication. What is an indication? The finding from the test. Okay, that's the best response from an NDT method. So what's a response then? Or what's an indication? What, what could that be? And anything, okay? Could be, a, could be a crack, that's an indication. What else could it be? Forged marking. marking, okay. A lap where two parts came together. Maybe it's where something's pressed into something else. And some of the, if we're talking about penetrant, the dye leak between those two things are pressed together. What else? A hard turn on the crankshaft. Okay, uh, a sharp corner, especially the inside. Where you get a flux leakage? An internal cavity. An internal cavity, welds. How about a fingerprint? Oh, yeah. Okay. Fingerprint. How about poor washing? <laughs> That's an indication. All right. So any of this can be an indication. Indication means you're getting a response from, from the method. So <clears throat> we're looking at, uh, say, magnaflux, magnetic particle inspection, and you've got... Um, if you washed apart with and used soap, maybe the soap dried and left a soap scum that kind of leaves a rough circle. How about that? So the uh, fluorescent particles tend to pull up around it just because they're trying to drain off and they pull up around it. There's an indication. Uh, fuzz off your shirt sometimes. Hair or something like a string lays on there. Indication. So any of these are indications, but what does that mean? A false indication. So first we get an indication. So, that's an N, indication. Indications are reasonably easy to get. And honestly, it's, it's not hard, it kind of is, to train somebody to do non-destructive testing, especially the two that we're gonna talk about. So when I talk about most non-destructive testing, we're strictly talking about uh, PT and MT. So it's not necessarily difficult to train somebody 
to do the procedures or at least to get them to tell you, okay, what are the procedures? And they'll tell you and, you know, you can watch them do a crankshaft. And, but I tell you, the minute I step out of the booth and, and walk away to answer the phone or something, they're going to be coming around the booth following me and go, okay, I got an indication. You know, it's like, okay. And so, you know, even, even somebody who's on their, I don't know, 10th engine or more, they're still constantly, you know, can you interpret this? Can you interpret this? So that leads us to this one, interpretation. Determining. Determining whether or not an indication is relevant or not. And I'll talk a little more about relevant versus non-relevant in a second. So we have false indication. What would give me a false indication? Not washing it, okay, not wa washing it properly, failure to wash it, your finger, dirty fingerprints all over it, some sort of fuzz or something on the part. Uh, false indication. Uh, an indication. An indication that is interpreted to be caused by a condition other than a discontinuity. An indication that is interpreted I am, oops, started right on right. Interpreted to be caused by a condition other than a discontinuity. What is a discontinuity? Crack. That's crack. That's a flaw. That's uh, uh, it's non-continuous. So it could be a crack. It could be. Um, like when they made it uh, a hollow spot in a part, something like that, but that's subsurface. So false indication. What are my false indications? <laughs> Could be fingerprint, flint, uh, flux concentrations in corners because you use too much amperage. Uh, it could be dye leaking out of a, a bolt hole or a part that was pressed together. What's that? Um, yep, something like that. So, okay, false interpretation. Um, so that was discontinuity is what I said. What is a discontinuity? A lack of continuity, interruption in the physical properties, or basically a crack. Discontinuity, lack of continuity. An interruption. An interruption in the physical property physical properties of the part. Okay, so if I get a discontinuity, I can put this crack. You're gonna put that. It doesn't have to be a crack, but that's basically what that's saying. It's got some sort of crack, it's got a problem, it's it's not whole. All right, so if I get a discontinuity, does that mean it's bad? No, nah, not necessarily. So that brings us to this, non-relevant, non-relevant. <coughs> like the nuts thing? On the crankshaft where you pressed in the nut for the propeller, I guess? Uh, flange bolts, flange bushings. I, I figured it out. <laughs> okay, non-relevant indication. Uh, could could a crack be a non-relevant indication? 
depends. Well, yes, yes, it very much could be. There are some items that have allowable cracks. There's not a lot in general in aviation. The engines I worked on, there were a few crank cases that had allowable cracks in the crankcase. Uh, there was none in the crankshafts and the steel part, that's for sure, but a non-relevant indication, and indications caused by a condition or type of discontinuity that is non-rejectable. So, an indication. I'm gonna scroll up just a little bit so I have more paper. Indication that is caused by a condition or type of discontinuity that is non-rejectable. A lap seam or something like that. Um, lap seam, when, you, when you're making metal and think of it when it's still hot and it's folded back upon itself, but it molds together, so you get a lap seam in there. So it may give you an indication. Uh, so then there's non-relevant and relevant. So what is a relevant indication? Cause for rejection. There we go, that's the best way to sum it up. An indication is caused by a condition or type of discontinuity that requires evaluation, which usually leads to rejection. So an indication that is caused by a condition that is caused by a condition that is caused by a condition or type of discontinuity that of discontinuity that requires evaluation. <coughs> All right, so sometimes, well often, so I'm working in the dark there and I'm working like on a crankshaft or something and I get an indication. So I get an indication, my first thought is, all right, is it relevant or non-relevant? Is it just something that's on the crankshaft, uh, you know, soap line or something like that, fuzz, um, a little scratch in the part that's collecting some of the, uh, the medium. And so the very next thing I do is I'm going to wipe it clean. So I'd have rags, a little scotch bright, something just to wipe and make sure that there's no marks on it. So I would do that, re-energize uh, re the part, check it again, and if the, it comes back, the indication comes back, then I'm gonna turn on the white lights and I'm gonna get a magnifying glass. I'm gonna look and see what I can see. Do I see anything that could be causing this to be happening? If I don't, back in the dark and then start evaluating it further. So maybe I would, um, you have to be careful because some parts, you, you're not allowed to grind on parts. Uh, so if you don't have data that says you can polish any more than you, what you've done, then you can't do anything. But uh, be honest, if I get a part where I've come to the point where it's like, okay, I've got an indication it's not a non-relevant, and now I have to call it a relevant indication, and I have to evaluate it, and then I evaluate it, and I say, okay, this is a part that can't have any discontinuities. This is some sort of discontinuity as I see it. I either, at that point, I'm red tagging it. So if I'm gonna red tag it, I might as well evaluate a little bit more. And so I would polish on a little more, or sand it a little more, or do something, as I've already red tagged it, theoretically, and if, I can get the discontinuity to come out even brighter, so be it, which often happens. Or if the discontinuity started to disappear, then okay, now I've got a crankshaft that I can, you know, or a part that I have to send out to somebody who has the technical expertise that they do have approval to grind or do whatever it is to remove that, that problem. Yeah. So in general, uh, you're looking for any further discontinuity in the part in terms of projection, or you, when, you, when you find that you continue to find to perform all tests. Okay, so if I'm doing, when I like crankshafts, I, I always say you guys, you'll, you'll say, so we'll put the, the um, flange to the left. It's just because the way I do things, I go from left to right. I always, so it's just natural, so I always put the flange on the left. 
where is the crankshaft most likely to crack? On the flange with the propeller spinning. So if I find a crack in the flange, I'm done. I don't care what the rest of it looks like. It doesn't matter. It's bad. So I may just look over it real quick to see, you know, for my own benefit to see, hey, if it cracks here, is it likely to propagate out? Is this likely to crack? Remember, I did a lot of prop strikes. So I saw a lot of crankshafts that have hit the ground. And so it's always interesting to me to see how far back the cracks go. They don't go back very far. <coughs> it's rare to see one on the rear end of it. Have you ever ground them out to see how deep they went? I have. Deep? I've had some, I've had some weird crankshafts that'll show like a fuzz and you can tell that it's a subsurface and, and, or you may even get a small indication showing its surface, but you can see that there's something else there. And so I had some, uh, some rubber abrasive things that I would have on a, a high speed air tool. And so I would, once I've decided, well, you know, it's gonna be crap or there's room to grind it. So if I have a crankshaft that's standard, and I know I can go 10 under, well, I can grind on a little bit and send it to somebody else who can grind it 10 under. So I'll just wanna see if it's worth sending out. So I'll grind on it a little bit. And every time I've done that, it's opened up a crack. It just comes out I'm like, whoa, there we are. So it's, Never have I started that and watched them go away. They, they always get worse. So like on a prop strike, does it usually, uh, the cracks usually go back to like the slinger ring or back further? Mm, usually just past the slinger ring at the worst. Remember, continentals are nitrided, light comings aren't. So light comings are gonna bend first. So I usually see them more around the slinger ring because the flange will bend, but continentals are nitrided, so they'll crack right up front. All right, so flaw, flaw is bad, an imperfection. Or discontinuity that may be detectable by NDT but is not necessarily rejectable. So it's not perfect, it's got a flaw, just like us. Are we rejectable? Yeah. I knew I was always gonna dog on Christian, so. <laughs> so fine, we'll use Christian. Does he have imperfections? Yes. But are we going to reject him? Yes. No. <laughs> All right. He just needs further evaluation, right? <laughs> Before we reject him. Yeah. Flaw, an imperfection or discontinuity. Can I spell discontinuity? I abbreviate that in some ways. That may be detectable. by NDT, but is not, but is not necessarily rejectable. Okay, so there's a, that's a flaw. Then there's a defect. An imperfection or discontinuity that may be detectable by NDT, but is not necessarily rejectable. Then there's a defect. That's Christian, defect, there we go. A flaw whose, whose size, shape, <laughs> size, shape, or other properties <laughs> do not meet acceptance criteria. <laughs> these are applicable to any NDT, all of these, these uh, definitions. So everything we've talked about so far is more or less applicable to all of the methods. <coughs> How are we doing, Janet? Uh, Hands getting sore? Yep, just a little bit. <laughs> I have like an inch and a half and then another one. <laughs> just an inch and a half? Well, how many do I have? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's talk about liquid penetrant.
All right, so we're going to talk, we're going to talk level one-ish stuff here, all right? So keep in mind that we're not going all the way into level three schooling here. It's, don't have time. Wish I did. All right, liquid penetrant inspection basics. How far can I go up here? Oh, I'm on number five. Yeah, on number five? Yeah. That, look at you go. <laughs> all right, liquid penetrant. What is the abbreviation? PT, right. liquid penetrant inspection, is a non-destructive testing method for locating. What kind of discontinuity? Surface or subsurface? Surface only must be open to the surface, this crack. If this crack is not open to the surface, this doesn't work. <coughs> NDT method for locating surface only discontinuities. In other words, in other words, the crack must be open to the surface. So how's this all going to work? Well, let's see here. Let's create some sort of part that has a discontinuity. And this is magnified 10,000 times. So I have a part with an open discontinuity. My steps involved is number one, and I'll write this down later. First, we got to clean. Okay, we have to clean the part. Uh, cleaning, cleaning is often overlooked and <coughs> underestimated. If I clean it wrong, this isn't going to work. So what are my cleaning methods can I use? Well, in the NDT books, they love to say vapor degreaser, but we live in California. That's not going to happen. So in a perfect world, we'd use uh, some sort of volatile uh, degreaser, vapor degreaser, and we would degrease it with that, but it's not good for the environment, so we can't do that. So now we have stuff like hot sea washers with soap, steam cleaning, pressure washing, um, citrus, citrus, citrus base cleaners, um, alcohol wipes at best, uh, things like that. So we want to get all the grease and stuff off of it. Well, what if it's got paint on it? Take it off. Why, why do I have to take paint off? Well, if there's a crack under the paint, then we could have a problem. So we don't want that. So we got to expose the part. So paint can cover up. Paint can bridge a gap, so it could crack under the paint. So it's got to be stripped of paint. What can we use to strip paint? So you're saying media blast. So what kind of media? Walnut. Walnut. Plastic. Plastic. No. 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 I'll throw a cookie at you. Uh, or baking soda. Something very soft. All right. And the reason why is, okay, so if we use glass sand, garnet, something like that, this crack is actually going to, it's going to peen itself over. It'll, it'll bring the metal and stretch the metal over. This is kind of why you're having problems with the cylinder today, because that had been done. So it can bridge that little gap, then we've sealed that up. Now we're not going to get anywhere with that. So we can't do that. That can be a cool project. Just seal up a crack? Do it once with it open, and then go media blast it or sand blast it, and then seal it with that gap. It's okay. Because it's frustrating when you can see the crack, but it's uh, yeah. it. Yeah, because what you're looking at is a, a crack that more or less kind of, it, it looks like this, and that doesn't hold penetrant. No. Not, well, it does, but not the, <coughs> not the uh, method we're using. It just washes right out. So you'd need uh, a different type of penetrant for that one. So, all right, so we clean it. So we, uh, how about wire, wire wheel? Grinder, belt sander, no. sandpaper. No. Okay, all of these are a no, because again, they're gonna seal up that crack. Paint thinner is fine. Okay, uh, you do want to think about 
not filling this up though with chemicals. You have to be careful with that because if, even if you fill it up with something, a penetrant can't get in, it's not going to work. So, all right, so we got our do's and don't do's. We clean it. What's the very next step? Dry it. Dry it. Well, okay, well, assuming it's wet, yes, I'd want it dried. So, um, I'm going to use red here. So, um, so, the very next step is we clean it. It's all clean and it's prepared and it's ready. Then we're going to apply penetrant. So, penetrant is applied to the surface that we want to inspect. We can spray it, brush it, dip it. Pour it, dip it, however you want to, but we apply the penetrant on top, and through capillary action, it seeps down into this crack. And we have to wait a while for this to happen. We can't just put it on and just rush off, right? So what is that called? Dwell time. Dwell time. Okay, so we wait the appropriate dwell time, 10 minutes to 120 minutes. Uh, if the crack is very small, I'd want a longer dwell time. If it's wide open, a shorter dwell time. If it's cold... I want a longer dwell time. If it's hot, a shorter dwell time. So I take these things into consideration. So we uh, we've let it dwell. Now we now what do we do? Okay, we got to remove the excess. It is dry, wet, dry. So if we're using this process here, so we use a dry towel and we wipe off as much as we can. You can wait a minute. Now, if I only do that much, I'm going to get red everywhere, so it's not really easy to do this, so let's just see here. Oops, I don't want mine. There we go. All right, so. Wipe out, dry, wet, dry. Use a dry cloth, dry cloth, dry cloth, using a, a new piece of the cloth every time. Then we'll do a wet, the solvent on the rag, and then one more dry. What happens if I spray solvent on here, Stephen? <laughs> Washes it all out, you get nothing. All right. Now what happens? Okay. As you do this, your inspection starts now, and you watch. And if you have a crack or discontinuity, dye will start seeping out. It is not your job to keep wiping it until it stops coming out of a crack. You watch it, and if you can see that it's coming out of a crack call it. Hey, I have an indication. It's coming out. I keep wiping it. It keeps coming back. Don't keep wiping, all right? Because eventually you wipe all the, the stuff out. Then we'll put um, a developer on, which you don't necessarily, I'm going to say you don't have to, because sometimes you can, it's just so obvious. It's like, why waste the time? Uh, developer and then inspect. And then we'll pick up from this tomorrow.